What was the theme of Jesus' teaching overall? The main subject. The thing that Jesus just kept coming back to. The point he could not get off of. What was it? It's important to answer that question rightly. It's important to find out things like that. What was it in the heartbeat of God and in the message of Jesus Christ that he continually drove home? What were the words or the phrases or the phrase that came out of his mouth more often than not when he chose to sit on the hillside and preach or get into a boat and teach or while he was walking along the Galilean seashore. What, what was he talking about? What was he talking about to his disciples when he rose again from the grave and he had 40 days and counting before he went back to heaven? What did he tell his disciples to talk about when he sent them out to preach? What was his forerunner talking about? What was, what was burning in God's heart? Well, I can distinctly remember not very long ago that I was listening to a Bible teaching like this and somebody, I was actually, I wasn't there, I was listening to it on a CD and somebody asked that question, what was the theme of Jesus' teaching? And I couldn't get to the button fast enough, I pushed pause on the, but, on, on the player because I wanted to know for myself. I didn't want him to go ahead and tell me, I'm, I can get this, what was the theme of Jesus' teaching? I know this and so I paused it. You know, I was the guy that if we were playing some Bible trivia game or something like that, I, I, I got a lot of right answers. And, well, I, I was a pastor, and I studied the Bible a lot. And so, so I knew little interesting facts, and I kind of have an idea of the historical outline of the Bible and, and a grasp on things. And I thought, of everything, I can get this one. What was the theme of Jesus' teaching? And I sat there, and I thought about it pretty deeply. And finally, I, I, I came in. I, I, was, I wasn't sure. I was doubting what I was thinking. I thought about five or six different things. Was it prophecy? Was it the new birth? Being born again? Salvation. It must have been salvation. Was it the Holy Spirit? What are some, what's the main theme of a lot of the groups around that, that have different characteristics? You, you can kind of pin that down. The Holy Spirit, maybe? Uh, uh, his commandments, was that what he talked about more than anything? Was it, was it prophecy? Was it salvation? And, and that's what I finally came to. I said, okay, I think it was salvation. Man's need to be saved was what Jesus talked about more than anything. And so I pushed play again. And the speaker said, the kingdom of God. And I went, the kingdom of God? What? That can't be right. But sure enough, open up your New Testament. Jesus talked about salvation a handful of times, maybe five. The new birth once. Prophecy a couple times. He talked about the Holy Spirit six or seven times. What about the love of God? Five or six times? Maybe more, maybe ten times? The kingdom of God came out of Jesus' mouth 128 times in the 89 chapters of the Gospels. Or the kingdom of heaven. It, was, it is by far the theme of Jesus Christ. It's the underlying current of everything he was talking about. It was the revelation that he came to bring. And then, the next question came. What is the kingdom of God? And I was humbled. I said, I don't even really know. Maybe something in the future. Maybe it's another term for heaven. I don't know. But I want to know. So I humbled my heart and I listened. And I started getting in the word and found great riches in the subject of the kingdom of God. I want to talk about the kingdom of God. I think there's an ignorance on this subject that's pervasive in the church that many people who claim to follow Jesus Christ don't even know what it's about to really be a part of his kingdom. The kingdom teachings of Jesus Christ haven't found root in their heart and therefore transformed their lives. 
There's a real ignorance on the subject. I want to share about it. The kingdom of God is what Jesus' forerunner was preaching. It's what Christ was proclaiming and what the multitudes were constantly hearing him talk about. Why was the kingdom of God the theme of Jesus' preaching and teaching and life? Because, believe it or not, it's the undercurrent and the theme of the entire Bible. The kingdom of God. God's desire to rule over his people as they're united to him in a love relationship that's rooted in obedience has been God's heart from the very beginning. It's what was lost in the garden in the first couple chapters of the Bible and it's what is restored through Christ and ultimately in the book of Revelation. The kingdom of God is the theme of the scriptures and so it shouldn't surprise us that it was the theme of the one who wrote the scriptures. Let's go to Exodus chapter 19 and follow this theme through. You know the story of how God chose a people, of how he came to a man named Abram and, and he called him out of his country. And he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. I know your wife is barren and beyond childbearing years anyway, but I'm going to make a nation out of you that's going to outnumber the stars of the sand of the seashore. And you just got to walk with me and, and come out and, and, and walk this journey of faith with me. I'm going to reveal myself to you. And God began to reveal himself to Abram. He changed his name to Abraham. He ended up fulfilling that promise through Abraham. A miracle. Isaac was born in his old age to a wife that was barren, had never had children. And God begins to build a nation and through Isaac came Jacob and, and through Jacob he had his 12 sons and they went into Egypt. You know the story. They betrayed their brother Joseph and Joseph went into Egypt and then later they all ended up moving to Egypt to be saved from the famine. And there this family of 70 souls or so at the time came into Egypt and 400 or so years later they were in the millions for a multitude but they weren't free they were slaves underneath horrible taskmasters and an evil king now you know the story again where Moses came in and God chose this man to lead the children of Israel out. And he brings this huge family out, if you would, this, this, this nation that he's built, that he's made out of Abraham. And, and they go through the fires of 400 years of slavery and then he brings them out and, he's, and he wants to rule over them and become their king and, and set them free from the oppression of the king that they were under. And God comes in and face to face just challenges this other king who was the most powerful ruler at the time. And God just humbles Pharaoh. He draws Pharaoh's army out into the wilderness and drowns them in the sea right in front of his people. God is beginning to get for himself a people and set up a nation and establish a kingdom. And now in Exodus chapter 19, he has them now brought out of Egypt through the Red Sea and he's brought them to the foot of Mount Sinai where he's about to deliver to them the laws of his kingdom. Because every kingdom has laws, you know. I mean, what is a kingdom in general? It's a system of government wherein there's one ruler and he has absolute authority over his subjects. That's it. It's kind of a foreign thing to us. We don't maybe understand the concept of kingdom as much. We might, un you know, we could write it down, maybe give a definition of what a kingdom is, but I don't know if anybody in here has really lived under a kingdom, except for now, as a born-again follower of Christ. But we don't live in a kingdom. Some places, I guess, still do. But a kingdom is that form of government by which there's one sole leader and all the subjects are coming under the submission of him. 
And that king's word is law. And so God, about to deliver his law, the Ten Commandments, and all the different regulations that he was going to give the people of Israel, he says this just before he gives the Ten Commandments. It's in Exodus chapter 19. And I want to read verse 3 through 6. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Two things. If you obey my voice and you keep my covenant, you're going to be special. You're going to be a peculiar people. You are going to be a kingdom of priests. You are going to be a holy nation. You're going to be totally different than any of the nations around you. You're going to be ruled by me. I will be your king. It will be a theocracy. I'm going to rule over you. People are going to look in and see something different. They're going to see something unique, peculiar. They're going to see a holy nation of people. They're going to see a kingdom that's full of, of priests. Priests, the, the connection between God and man. Those who represent the Lord to people. You're going to be like that. If you obey me, if you keep my covenant, it's going to happen. This is God's desire. He wanted to rule over them. Remember we, we saw a couple weeks ago where God said, oh, that they just had a heart in them, that they might fear me always and obey my commandments, that I might be well with them. You see, God knows that we need to be governed. God knows what's best for us. And God, his law and his truth and his words and his direction and his advice is valuable. And it's life that it might go well with them. That's God's heart. You're going to be a peculiar people. I'm going to make you special. Trust me. Obey me. I'm going to be your king. Pharaoh, he's done. He's at the bottom of the sea. I'm your new king. He's not trying to rule over them as a tyrant. He wants to be a blessing. You will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so the people... You know the story. They very quickly rebelled against the sovereignty of their God. And only two people that were over the age of 20 from that original congregation stepped foot into the promised land. That's quite a thing to consider. God saved millions of people out of Egypt. How many of them were over 20 years old? A million to be conservative? None of them entered in except for two people, Joshua and Caleb, into the promised land. The rest died in the wilderness because they didn't trust their king. And so the history of Israel went on. After Moses came Joshua, and Joshua led the conquest of the land of Canaan, as you know. And then after that was the time of the judges, about 300 years, where the judges would be used of God to help bring the people back to righteousness. God was still their king, but the judges God would raise up to, to speak on his behalf and to lead the people into victory and to, to set them free from the oppression that God, their king, allowed to come into their lives to chasten them. And at one point they even wanted to make one of the judges a king. His name was Gideon. Rule over us and let your children rule over us. And Gideon said, I won't. God will rule over you. He knew that's not God's will. God is our king. And God's will and his desire for Israel was for him to be their king. You can see this very vividly in 1 Samuel chapter 8, if you want to go there. Samuel was the last judge of Israel. The last judge because after the judges came the time of the kings. And Saul was the first king of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, it says, The elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, 
Look, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. We want to be like the rest of the nations, Samuel. Set a king over us. And you know what happened to Samuel's heart? It sunk when he heard that. Verse 6 says, The thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. You see, Samuel, who was at that time probably the closest man in Israel to the heartbeat of God, when he heard people have this great idea to have a king, hey, we got a good idea, let's have a king, let's be like the other nations, let's have a king that leads us in and out and, and gives us a law and has a dynasty and has a castle and let's, let's do that. Where people were excited about that, Samuel was grieved. He said, no, oh. That's not God's heart. It's not what he wants. And God was grieved. He said, Samuel, it's not you they rejected. It's it's me. In asking for a king, they rejected me. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 12, this is, now again, we just read that God said, but do what they say. This is at the coronation of the first king of Israel, Saul. What an interesting speech that's given by Samuel. First Samuel chapter 12, verse 16. He says, Therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is today not the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord and he will send thunder and rain that you may perceive and see that your wickedness is great which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking a king for yourselves. And so Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that they may not die. For we have added to all our sins the evil of asking a king for ourselves. This was, it doesn't seem like a very bad thing at face value. So what? They wanted a king. But here God, through Samuel, is saying, Do you want to know how bad this is? And then he calls out in the middle of the harvest time and thunder and rain come, a sign from God at his displeasure at their decision to have a king. This was a sad day in Israel. The day that God was rejected as reigning over them. In fact, in Hosea chapter 13... Verse 9, God said this, O Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. I will be your king. Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities and your judges to whom you said, Give me a king and prince? I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. God is giving Israel a king in his anger. And God took Saul away in his wrath. God said, I'm the one to help you. Look unto me. I will deliver you. There's none beside me. If you'd only trust me, if you just do what I say, if you would believe, if you'd put your faith in me and follow me, it would go well with you, with your children forever. But they wanted something tangible. They wanted something they could, somebody that they could see. They wanted a place that they could say, there's the kingdom, there's the castle, there's the place. This is our dynasty. This is the kingdom of Israel. And so God allowed it to happen. And if you've read First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you know the story. Even First Samuel and Second Samuel, you know the story of the kings. Even the best committed adultery and murder. Yeah, there were some that had aspects of God that, that, that shined and, and God uses as types and shadows of his son, Jesus Christ. But by and large, they would have been better off having God rule over them. This is the nature of the kingdom of God. 
And it sounds silly to almost say it and, and so simple, but we got to get it into our minds and our hearts that God is the king. He wants to reign in your life. He wants to rule in my heart. He wants to be the head of his church. And he deserves it. He's the only one worthy. He's the only one able to have that kind of position and stay humble. He's the only one that can judge with righteousness and truth. He's the king. And you can see this drama building in the Old Testament. We're only touching on a few different places, but you'll see this, this undercurrent going through the word of God concerning his kingdom. Israel's history is a sad story of what it looks like when God is not allowed to rule over his people. Again, there's glimpses. It's not all bad. It's not all darkness. There's glimpses of hope. But by and large, it's a picture of how badly we need God to be our king. Now, during the times of the kings, there were always those who looked beyond the earthly kingdoms into the kingdom of God because God didn't stop ruling in essence he, he wasn't he didn't just check out he responded when sought to or sought after he moved on behalf of his people he still gave instruction through the prophets he gave instruction through the kings at times who drew near to him and God still patiently worked with his people but this wasn't the best plan <coughs> but there were those during the times of the kings and the times I guess between the judges and the, the last king where prophets would rise up and speak forth God's heart. One of the kings himself, David, in the Psalms wrote things like this. Psalm chapter 110. They knew there was much more to the kingdom than what they saw with their eyes or what they were experiencing in Israel. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. David knew there's, there's a Lord above me. The Lord said to my Lord, this is about Jesus. Jesus himself quoted this scripture about himself. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. In the, be in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning you have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and, sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek means the king of righteousness. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations and shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. He shall drink of the brook of the wayside. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Prophecies started to begin to be birthed in the heart of people about the coming of the kingdom of God, about God's true heartbeat and what he wanted to happen, about what was coming in the future. Messianic prophecies of Jesus coming, the Messiah reigning in his kingdom and what it would look like. They're all over the place in the, in the Old Testament. They fill the prophets in the Psalms. They're pieces of songs and uh, different utterances that people give. You, you get these glimpses of the kingdom of God. Another one, Psalm chapter 2. Listen to this. It says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth have set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that is the Messiah, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Hey, we're not going to have God rule over us, is what he says that the nations are saying. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. 
You shall break them with a rod of iron and shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings, and be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed, blessed are those, all those, who put their trust in him. People singing these songs about the messianic kingdom that's coming. Oh, we could go to many different places. I can't help but read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And here's Isaiah, looking around at the kingdom falling apart around him, looking at the wars that are taking place, looking at the greed and the covetousness, looking at the sexual immorality that is permeating the very throne room of the kingdom of Israel. And here he is going, look down the future though. Here comes the Messiah. The increase of his government, it's never going to end. Praise the Lord. They were looking in hope to something that only God could bring. And a very vivid one, one more that I want to read is in Daniel. Chapter 2. I would encourage you, as students of the Word of God, to go through the Word and study out the subject of the kingdom. Just look up the word kingdom. It's exciting. Daniel chapter 2. He prophesies, actually, by interpreting a dream. Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember, the one who came and was used of God to chasten and discipline the children of Israel because they refused to obey him as king. He used Nebuchadnezzar to come in and lead them off into Babylon for 70 years. And while they were there, he gave a dream to the king of Babylon. And you probably remember that dream. The king of Babylon had this dream and, and there was this great big statue, this image, and the head was of gold and, and it had iron and bronze and all these different metals that made up its body and each one of them represented a different kingdom he didn't know that and in fact it was such a vivid dream that he was going to execute everybody in his kingdom at least all the satraps and the wise men and the magicians and all of them he said if you can't tell me the meaning of this dream not only the meaning but tell me the dream itself i'm going to kill you all of you and you remember the story daniel he just said oh lord we need your mercy show us and god revealed in the night to Daniel, the dream and the interpretation. And he came before Nebuchadnezzar, and there he was. And Nebuchadnezzar couldn't believe his ears as, as Daniel rattled off his dream and the interpretation. And this is part of that interpretation. It says in verse 44 of chapter 2, In the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom that shall never be destroyed. The kingdom that shatters every other kingdom. The kingdom that whose ruler will not die, the, the kingdom that cannot be overthrown, the kingdom that Jesus came to set up and preach about. People were in tune with the heartbeat of God. There was always a remnant that knew it was so much more than this earthly kingdom. One man that was very in tune with the heart of God spent all of his time in the wilderness praying, fasting, and one day he got the go-ahead from the Father to go and start preaching. And this is what he said. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
No more waiting. No more looking down the future. But John the Baptist knew that he was called by God to prepare the very way for the king. The king is here. The kingdom is at hand. It approaches. It's very near. Open up your eyes. It's happening right now. Repent. And this message of the kingdom of God was ringing in the ears of people as John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness. It says all of Judea went out to him. The kingdom of God. They knew this term. It permeates the rabbinic writings. The, the kingdom of God. The expectation. Now, people had many different ideas of what the kingdom of God was, but whatever was happening, there was a crazy man out in the wilderness saying, it's happening now. The kingdom. Repent. Get your life in alignment with the reality of the kingdom of God because it's here. The kingdom that Jesus brought was much different however, than a lot of people expected. They expected freedom from the tyranny of Rome. Jesus came to set them free from the tyranny of Satan. They expected revolt against the government oppression. Jesus declared war on sin and the flesh. They expected national recognition. Jesus came to break the false concept that they were God's children because of their heritage. They expected a man on a horse with great majesty. They got a man on a donkey with great humility. They expected strong, mighty men to accompany their new king. Jesus trained fishermen, tax collectors, and zealots to be meek and merciful. They expected riches and palaces. Jesus preached willing poverty and slept under the stars. They pictured armor, combat boots, and a sword. Jesus wore a simple robe, sandals, and he fought with the words of his mouth. They wanted a prince of power. They got the prince of peace. And it totally revolutionized and flipped everything upside down. And he's doing nothing less today in the message of the kingdom. It's not that Jesus wasn't offered or couldn't have had a physical kingdom. Both Satan and men offered it to him, and he refused. When tempted for 40 days in the wilderness, Satan himself said, All the kingdoms of the world can be yours if you worship me. And saints, do you know that that's the cost of the kingdom of this world? That's what you're doing when you adopt the kingdom of this world, when you submit yourself underneath the leadership and the authority and the commandments of this world, you're worshiping the devil. That's the line that the New Testament draws. He who makes himself a friend of this world is the enemy of God. Making yourself a friend of this world is an open declaration of war against the king of heaven. Jesus said, I will not worship you. I'll worship the Lord God only, and him only will I serve. And he refused the earthly kingdom. People tried to give it to him. In fact, by force, Jesus had to run away. He fled into the mountains when they tried to make him a king by force. This isn't the kingdom that he came to set up. What they were, many of them were looking for. He could have had it, but he was too in tune with his father to fall into that trap. The kingdom Jesus came to set up was spiritual. But don't confuse spiritual for theoretical. Spiritual things are more real than fleshly things in that they're eternal and they don't die or fade away. Just because something is spiritual does not mean that it's not real. Jesus came to set up a spiritual, real kingdom. And that's what he preached. But it was different. The kingdom of God is not of this world. Jesus, when standing before Pontius Pilate, a king, if you would, of his day, a man in great authority, though he wasn't Caesar, 
he had great authority in Jerusalem. John chapter 18, Jesus, the true king, standing before an earthly king, gets into an interesting conversation. John 18, verse 33. This is right before his crucifixion. Jesus has been taken and and handed over to Pontius Pilate. And here he is is standing in Pontius Pilate's private room, the praetorium. Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Did you know Jesus was crucified and that was his accusation? He was the king of the Jews. This is the king of the Jews. It's why they crucified him. Because he wouldn't deny the fact that he was a king. He couldn't. He spoke the truth. It was the final point of leverage that they used against him to say, this man calls himself a king. We have one king and that is Caesar. And here, this this age-old question from Pilate, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him in verse 34, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? I love the Lord. I could just see him looking right into Pilate's eyes and just saying, do you really want to know? Because I'll tell you. Are you just cross-examining me? Or do you really want to know if I'm a king? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus doesn't get off the subject of the king and the kingdom. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. My servants, or if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now, my kingdom is not from here. In essence, Pilate, yes, I'm a king, and I have a kingdom. I know that you might not be able to see that right now. I don't know if at this time or after this, shortly after this, they're going to put a crown of thorn on his head, or a crown of thorns on his head, and wrap him in a, a mockery of a robe. And it looks anything but a kingdom. But here he is saying, Pilate, you got to understand, my kingdom's not from here. And Pilate said, are you a king then? And Jesus said, you say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born. And for this cause I came into the world. That I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said, what is truth? What a conversation. Jesus didn't just answer with a simple yes. He said, Pilate, I was born for this. This is who I am. I am a king like you could never imagine. He could have said a lot of things. One day, Pilate, you're going to bow your knee before me. It's going to happen. Whether you want to or not. Pilate, you've disobeyed me many times. It's mercy that you're still alive. Pilate, I have an army at my bidding that would cause your army to die if they even just looked at us in our mighty array. You have no idea, Pilate, the authority that has been given to me. But instead, he simply just said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, it would be obvious. We'd be fighting, but we're not. And we won't. Christ's kingdom is so contrary to this world. 
Christ's kingdom is very contrary to your carnal way of thinking and mine. In Christ's kingdom, you're the strongest when you realize your weakness. You save your life by losing it, and you lose your life when you seek to save it. In Christ's kingdom, you will be humbled if you seek to exalt yourself. And if you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. In his kingdom, the way up is down, and the way down is up. When you're poor, you have the power to make others rich, and when you're rich, you often lose the ability to enrich others. In Christ's kingdom, we have the most when we give the most away and possess the least when we have the most. In Christ's kingdom, the last is first and the first is last. We secure our future by refusing to save. We're the wisest when we realize we know nothing. Its leaders lead by serving. Its warriors conquer by dying. Its wealth, wealthy give from poverty. And its king rules by washing feet. It's an upside-down kingdom compared to anything we could imagine. But it's the kingdom that Jesus Christ came to establish and that I am so privileged to be a part of. It's a kingdom that, that brings life and truth and has the answers. It's a form of government. It's the only form of government that works. Christ and his kingdom and his church operating in brotherly love one toward another. It's a piece of heaven here on earth. Jesus, in, in the prayer that he gave in the Sermon on the Mount, the first request, after saying, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. First request, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the realm in which God's will is loved and fulfilled. The kingdom of God is the society of people that live under the rule of God. It's the culture that is formed when people live how God wants them to. It's the nation that's produced when God's allowed to govern his people. It refers neither to a place nor a time, but a condition in which the rulership of God is acknowledged and obeyed. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What makes God's kingdom his kingdom is that his will is being done. It's where the active will of the king is being accomplished by those who are serving him and those whom he's ruling over. Israel would have been his kingdom if they obeyed his voice and kept his covenant. If they just simply did what he said and, and laid everything else down and in humility said, God, you know the best way. You know the best way for me to live. You know what makes a person happy and fulfilled. You know what brings death. And you know what happens when sin is allowed to fester. You know what a lustful mind will do to an individual and to others eventually. You know what unforgiveness does, what bitterness does to the heart. You know what jealousy and theft and cursing and evil speaking and sin does. And you have wisdom, Lord, and we believe you that you have the right and the true way. Right are your ways, O Lord, and we want to follow after you. It's when somebody like Jesus in the garden says, Not my will, but yours be done. There the kingdom of God is. And it becomes beautiful when many people start to gather together with that same heart because the kingdom of God is manifested in a powerful way. Christ is in the midst. The church is the kingdom of God. Now, the Bible does speak of the kingdom of God as something in the future as well. It talks about sitting down in the kingdom of God with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Jesus talked about a future aspect of the kingdom of God. 
But Jesus, in his time, he said from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God is preached and many are pressing into it. He said the kingdom of God won't come with observation. You won't be able to say, here it is, or look over there. It's within you. His kingdom. So how can we, how can we wrap our, our minds or our hands around this thing, the kingdom? I think if we're looking for something outwardly, we're looking in the wrong direction. It's not at that church building over there. It's not this tent here. There's no Mecca or a place that you need to go and touch something or be somewhere. There's no man that is ruling over the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where Christ is allowed to rule. And I believe it's that simple and that profound and that beautiful. I'm sad to say, though, that many people... One byproduct of not understanding the kingdom or giving it the place that it deserves in, in our preaching and teaching and our understanding is that many people don't feel like they need to live in the kingdom. Their idea of Christianity is the kingdom of God is such a shallow view. It's that the kingdom of God is, is a place I'm going to go when I die. And therefore their Christianity is primarily about going to heaven when I die. It's all about when I die and I don't have to worry about this life. But God wants us to, like Paul said, be translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, says in Colossians, to be translated into the kingdom of the son of his love. Now. And when you come into the kingdom, you realize that, that more than just changing where you're going to go someday, Christ wants to rule and reign over every aspect of your life. And instead of being bummed out by that, you're blessed by that. You don't go, oh no, there's all these commandments or, or he actually has things to say about uh, whether or not I'm supposed to sue somebody and, or whatever it might be or what I'm supposed to do when, when somebody takes my stuff. And Oh, no, his commandments are not burdensome as a genuine disciple of Christ says. They're not burdensome. You come to a place where you submit yourself underneath the hand of your king and you say, your wish is my command, Lord. I'm your loyal subject. What do you want for me? What do you want for us? Teach me. Let your reign and your rule fully take over my life. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. In my life, in our lives, here on earth, as it is in heaven. And I guarantee if you don't enter into the kingdom now, you will not enter into the kingdom in eternity. You gotta enter now. You gotta press into it. You gotta commit yourself to enter into and abide within the kingdom of God. Another way of saying it is confess Jesus to be your Lord. Not just with your mouth, but with your life. Is he your Lord? That's a term we throw around. It, Lord means king. It just simply means king. Is he your king? Jesus said no man can serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other, or you'll be loyal to the one and you will despise the other. You see, the thing about the kingdom of God is it calls for undivided loyalty and allegiance. There's no middle ground. Have you made the kingdom commitment? Have you unashamedly and unreservedly said, I'm in, Lord. Rule me. Teach me. Correct me. Train me and make me like you. Or do you think that you can hang on to the kingdom of this world? Are you still taking your cues from this world? The commercials that come on TV, the billboards that say things at you, the perspective that the world is running after, everything that, that this world is telling you you need to have or that you need to be or that you need to say or that you need to wear. Is this kingdom still got your affections? Have you made the kingdom commitment? 
I want to read something that really struck me. Just an example of how our nation requires people to make a commitment if they want to become a citizen of this government system. When foreigners desire to become citizens of the United States of America, they're required to take the following oath. I hereby declare an oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by law, that I will perform non-combatant service in the armed forces of the United States when required by law, that I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by law, and that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. That's what someone gets into when they want to become a citizen of this country. And according to an earthly country, it makes sense. You can't just come in here and, and then if we go to war against Germany, start fighting with the Germans just because you originally were from Germany. Someone can't come over here and start driving 85 miles an hour down through town and say, well, back in Ireland, the speed limit was a lot faster. You're not in Ireland anymore, buddy. Time to go to jail, is what the police officer would kindly say. You're here now. You're in this kingdom. You're in this culture. You're in this society. Do we think that Christ Jesus has any less of a requirement of us that when we become a part of his kingdom, that we're, do, do we believe that we're supposed to renounce all allegiance to any other kingdom? Do we believe that, that, we, that we're able somehow to kind of straddle the fence and have one foot in the kingdom of this world and one foot in the kingdom of God? Is that even biblical? Does that even sound like Jesus? He said, unless a man forsakes all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. If any man puts his hand to the plow and looks back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus had some requirements some standards, some information at the get-go. Count the cost. Which of you building a tower does not sit down first and consider whether he has enough money to finish it? And if you don't, the half-built structure is going to stand as a testimony that you started and you didn't finish. Or which king with 10,000 is going out against somebody with 20,000 does not first send delegations of peace? Count the cost. It's serious. Have you made this commitment to the kingdom of God, to Jesus, the king? Or do you have some idea that there's a place reserved for you, but you don't really have to be a part of something now? Can you say that you've undividedly given your loyalty to Christ and his kingdom? Do you still allow this world's perspective to influence you? Are you willing to fully embrace all of Christ's commandments as the governing principle of your life? And as he gives you further revelation of what they mean, are you willing to, no matter what the cost, follow him? No matter what the cost. Even if it means changing your entire life, uprooting everything you know. Do you believe in Jesus' principles about marriage? Or do you let this world tell you what a real marriage is? and what divorce is. Because they, they'll tell you what it is. You can go get a divorce real quick. You can get remarried, no problem. What does Jesus have to say about that? What's the governing principle of his kingdom? What about self-defense? Oh, but I'm an American. I have the right to defend myself. What did Jesus say? Will you allow his hard teachings to come in and totally transform the way that you think? What about money? Well, everybody knows a wise man saves up for the future. And it's okay to be rich. Have you read what Jesus had to say? I encourage you to see what he had to say about mammon. 
read his warnings, read his perspective. Cultivate a heart that says, God, I want that. Is Christ's kingdom like a pearl of great price to you, wherein you're wor- you, you, it's worth selling everything to have it? Is it like leaven, like Jesus said, that when it comes in, it just permeates everything and it just grows and, and, and just leavens the whole lump? Is this kingdom like that in your heart? Have you realized yet that the kingdom of God is not just somewhere you go when you die, but a condition of heart and life that you must live out now? The kingdom of God is the most radical and life-altering concept that has been ever presented to mankind. If you haven't yet, will you join the ranks of the kingdom of God? Or will you be swallowed up by the kingdom of this world? We all have that choice. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you that Jesus came to set up a kingdom. I praise your name for that. I thank you that you included me, Lord. By your mercy, God, you included me. Oh, Father, I I thank you that I know there's some in this tent, Lord, that you've included in your kingdom. They've entered in, Lord God. They've pressed in. And, Lord, they're citizens of, of you. They're allowing you to rule in their life, oh God, to govern them, to be their God. Father, we've come to find that your way is the best. Lord, we want your way. And I know there's ways, Lord God, that we still need to learn. God, please teach us. Help us to grow out of childhood into adulthood, Lord, in the spirit. Help us to be faithful citizens of your kingdom. We praise your holy name, O God, and I ask that you would reveal yourself to any in here that may not know you and may not be a part of your kingdom. I pray that you would draw them by your spirit, O God, and that they would hear the clear call to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you want to hang out and talk and share, I'd be blessed by that.